Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. In today's video, I'm going to be going through an example on how to design a bolted splice connection for a beam. So first off, I'm just going to give a brief introduction into bolted beam splice connections. So why do we need them? Well, the main reason is probably for transportation due to site requirements. A lorry can only carry a certain length of beam. So if your beam is say 16 meters long, but the lorry can only carry a 10 meter length beam, you'll want to split the beam into two. Alternatively, in house renovations, even a beam that is only say six meters long could warrant having a splice connection. Maneuvering a beam in a tight space is very tricky if the beam is too long, so reducing the length by introducing a splice is very, very common. So where's the best place to actually position a splice connection? Well, that actually depends on how the beam is loaded. You really need to look at the force diagram to see where the best position could be. Say for example, in a simply supported beam, the middle of the beam is actually the worst position to have a splice because that's where the highest moment and shear force is. An ideal position may be at the third point where the moment is less. You also need to find out from the contractor what the longest beam length can be transported on a lorry as that will also give you a constraint to think about. There are essentially two types of splices, bolted and welded. Welded is quite uncommon because site welding generally is not very accepted on construction sites because of the health and safety risks and hazards. That is why it's generally more preferable to use a bolted splice connection. So let's move on to the beam splice design example. The example I'm going to show you is the example given in the SCI manual P398 moment resisting joints to Eurocode 3. It's a very long calculation, which is why normally these designs are actually done on software, but like with all designs, it's really worth going through the calculation to make sure that you understand the fundamentals. Okay, so this is P398 from the SCI. SCI does very good documents for steel design, so it's really worth checking them out. So in this example, we've got a 457 UB, which we need to design a bolted splice connection for. The connection is going to be a non-slip at serviceability, and as you can see from the force diagram, there are shear, actual and bending moments to consider. So the first thing to do is to list out the data for your beams, plates, bolts and material safety factors. We're going to assume a 12mm thick cover plate for the flanges and a 10mm thick cover plate for the web. We'll be considering two sizes of bolts, M20s and M24s. The yield strength for the plates and the bolts are from the Eurocode's National Annex and likewise for material safety factors for structural steel and connections. Okay, so this next step is to work out the internal forces at the splice connection. We need to work out which proportion of the moment is carried in the web and which proportion is carried in the flange. And also likewise, which proportion of the actual force is carried in the flange and in the web. You can then work out the forces in the flange due to bending using these equations and you need to do the same with the actual force. Then you can work out the forces in the web and then you just repeat the process for the forces at SLS. The shear resistance of bolts at ULS and SLS is given in P363 and it's given in both single and double shear. For design, shear force can be resisted by six M20 bolts in single shear. And this is done simply by multiplying the bolt shear resistance by six. And you'll do the same for the serviceability limit state. So next we want to check the full bearing resistance of the M20 bolt. And because this value is greater than the bolt in single shear, we can essentially use three lines of two bolts at a convenient spacing. We need to do a similar check for the web splice, but this time the full bearing resistance is less than the resistance in double shear. Therefore, the spacing needs to adhere to the minimum spacings, which we're about to calculate here. So we're just going to initially try three bolts at a vertical spacing of 120mm distance. Because we need a 70mm distance from the centre line of the splice, there's going to be an additional moment due to the eccentricity of the bolt group. So all you do is multiply the shear force by the eccentric length. So as you can see here, with only three bolts, the bolt resistance is not enough to resist the shear, actual and bending moments. So let's add another line of bolts with a 85mm horizontal spacing. The additional moment due to eccentricity is also going to increase because we're increasing the distance to the centre of the bolt group. So next we have to work out something called the polar moment of inertia of the bolt group. And it's defined a little bit better on page 54 of the same document. 
So next we need to work out the horizontal and vertical component of the force on each bolt. So if you imagine that the bending moment is acting in the center of the bolt group, you're going to get horizontal and vertical forces on the outermost bolts. Finally, you work out the resultant force of the most highly loaded bolt, and it's quite easily shown in the diagram to the right. Because this force is less than the full bearing resistance that we calculated earlier, the spacing is going to be satisfactory. And here we're basically going to repeat the same steps but for the SLS loads. So now it's a good time to draw a diagram and put some dimensions on the bolt configuration which we've just calculated. When you're listing the direction of the spacing, make sure that it's written very very clearly. So in step 3 we're checking the resistance of the flange splices. And first off we just want to check the resistance of the bolt group. Take a second to read this paragraph and feel free to pause the video if you will need more time to read it. Next we need to check the resistance of the cover plate due to tension in the flange. It's very easy so just follow the equations and make sure that the applied tension is less than the resistance of the flange cover plate. So next we need to check the block tearing resistance. There are essentially two failure modes that we need to check and this is shown in the diagram here. So to determine which failure mode that we need to check, it's basically to do with the edge distance and how much less or more it is to the transverse spacing. In this example, because the edge distance of 30mm is much less than a transverse spacing of 120mm, we need to check the failure mode as shown in diagram A. So like before, just follow the equations, plug the numbers in, and then check that the design force is less than the resistance. Next we need to check the cover plate due to compression forces. To see if we need to check for buckling, we need to satisfy this first equation. Once you've plugged the numbers in, you'll find that we do need to check for buckling. So like with all buckling checks to steel, this is no different. If you would like a more detailed explanation on how to calculate the buckling resistance, I've done a video on a simple steel column design which goes through buckling in a little bit more detail, so go check it out. I'll leave a link to the video in the description below. Now we're moving on to checking the resistance of the web splice. We have already previously checked the resistance of the bolt group for the web, which is how we came up with the original configuration anyway. We then need to move on to do a check of the web cover plate in shear. Checking the shear resistance in steelwork is almost the same in almost all scenarios. Essentially you're just checking the net area subjected to the shear force. So like with the flange cover plates we also need to check for block tearing as well for the web. Again just follow the equations and we'll find that the block tearing resistance is more than adequate. Now we need to check the resistance of the beam web itself not the cover plate. The resistance of the beam web would have been done when you were designing for beam anyway, so we don't need to check it again. What we will need to check is the resistance of the net shear area, so just follow the equation here. Because this beam is not a notched beam, we don't need to check the resistance to block tearing. And finally, we need to check the resistance of the web cover plate to the combined bending, shear and axial force. Again, just follow the equations and you'll get your answer. So as you can tell, the design of the splice connections is really, really long winded and it takes a really long time if you are to do it by hand. Like I mentioned right at the start, most of these connection designs are going to be done by computer software. Using robot structural analysis, I've basically put in the example into the connection designer and just to check that it all kind of works. However, it's really important that if you're not familiar with how a software does their calculations, it's really important that you go through the calculation and make sure it's used the correct values and the correct formulas, and especially that it's used the right code. Hopefully you found this video useful. If you want to see more videos like this, please remember to like and subscribe, and I'll catch you on the next video. Cheers.